Uh, good morning, church. Uh, good to be with you today. Uh, today's passage is from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, uh, verse 1, uh, 11 through 15. So would you all stand up if you can? And we're going to proclaim the word of God and we'll take turn. So I'm going to go first and then you follow. While, uh, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest and everything that, they happened, that had happened. <laughs> Telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Amen. You may be seated. It's good to be with you this morning. Um, my mom is still living in South Korea. And um, every Monday, um, I call her and she calls me. So that, you know, we um, have a little chat, at least, you know, once a week uh, through car talk, of course, these days. Um, and once in a while, she gives me the, uh, the feedback of my sermon. So in other words, she watches my sermon every Sunday. I hope she doesn't watch this one, but... Uh, <laughs> um, and in the middle of our conversations, she was saying, like, you shouldn't offend the congregation by using you. So I was like, well, what's the difference, you know, like we versus you? It seems like, you know, this kind of Korean mentality or the mindset that, you know, we should be very modest in our speech, not directly referring you, but instead, you know, she was saying that I should use this we. Does that make sense to you? Does it make a huge difference to you as well? Oh, you guys are like my mom, huh? Okay. <laughs> I was getting defensive. I'm like, Mom, this is just, you know, English. It's you. <laughs> so the point that she made was kind of interesting that at the end of my sermon uh, last Sunday, of course, that was, you know, for KM, but I was saying something like, among you, there must be someone who, you know, are not saved yet. So I was just kind of like uh, not accusing any of the persons who are not saved yet, but I was just reminding the fact that just because you come to church doesn't mean that you are born-again Christians. Make sense? But mom, my mom was saying, you should be used we <laughs> among us. There must be someone who is not being saved yet. I was like, okay, you know, what a difference. So we kind of debated a little bit. But uh, here's my point. Uh, if I ever offended you, uh, whether that was my sermon or, you know, my speech, my prayers, uh, my apology, okay? My intention is not to hurt you, but to challenge you. Amen? Okay, so that's my apology up front. And also, in advance, I have to apologize because today's message is pretty offensive. Okay. I don't want to tone down the scriptures sometimes, but again, my intention is not to hurt you, but to pierce your hearts, hopefully by the Holy Spirit, not by my you know, personal agenda, but through the Holy Spirit, hopefully God pierces our heart and penetrates our souls, even to marrows, right? The Word of God is living words and sharper than the two, a double-edged sword. So I do truly believe that, you know, sometimes God really speaks right into our hearts and challenges us. And I really hope and pray that that would happen today. Okay, so uh, some of you probably uh, had a chance to read this book, Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code. How many of you have, you know, had a chance to read this book? Okay, all right. That's good. That's good. Um, 
you know, there, there are some of the books, you know, in our lifetime that you want, you once you just read it and then you never forget. To me, this book is one of those books, okay? Not in a good way, of course. Not because the content of the book was so impressive or so good, but it's the other way around, you know? Oh, wow, this book is really messed up. <laughs> but this book became, what, the best seller. I'm not sure about the steady seller, but you know, back in the days, it, you know, it came out like 2003, and it was a big hit, right? And um, so it was also made into a movie in 2006, starring Tom Hanks, who was a well-known uh, actor for his role in Forrest Gump. Oh, I love this movie, Forrest Gump. That was one of my favorite movies, and, you know, uh, from that movie, I got to know this Tom Hanks, and he became one of my, you know, favorite actors, but I got so disappointed, the fact that, you know, he was in this movie, The Da Vinci Code. Are you with me? Um, so I got disappointed. Um, however, you know, this conspiracy, uh, for those who, you know, have no idea about, you know, this Da Vinci Code, it basically, you know, um, the author... Dan Brown was saying that, you know, Jesus even didn't die in the first place. And then, you know, um, uh, Mary Magdalene was, you know, Jesus' wife, and they had a hidden child and so on. See, that's just, yeah, very crooked kind of theology. But of course, it's a novel, but he mixed it up with some, some of the facts, historical facts, right? Uh, so, you know, it confuses people. Um, sounds pretty convincing, uh, yeah, to a point. So a lot of people just love this book and watch the movie, right? But in the 19th century, a significant figure named Ernest Renan emerged. Renan, who was raised in a conservative Catholic family in France and later became a clergyman. And he was very uh, influenced by the uh, philosophies of Hegel and Kant. Okay? So that's a wrong influence, but he began to interpret the Gospels from this rational standpoint, therefore, and leading him to express doubts about the resurrection in his book, The Life of Jesus. That's the title of the book that he wrote. Right? The Renan's work, which is suggested that Mary Magdalene's love for Jesus led her to mistake the gardener for Jesus in her grief. And this book sold 60,000 copies in its first month. And this success highlights the influence of such theologies or theories on the public perception of Jesus. In 1966, another book, a book titled The Passover Plot, uh, it came out, published by the um, British Jewish historian Hugh Sconfield. Hugh J. Sconfield. According to Sconfield, Jesus himself planned to be crucified. He revealed this plan to Joseph of uh, Arimathea and Nicodemus, and along with a, a Jewish high priest who helped orchestrate this fake, fabricated resurrection event. And these conspirators planned to give Jesus a drug that would make him appear dead, potentially mixed in a sponge of vinegar or wine offered to Jesus on the cross. You know, some might wonder, who would buy and read such a ridiculous book, right? However, this book sold over 100,000 copies in the first five months and surpassed its 11th printings before reaching two years. That's a crazy. To make matters worse, the William Barclay, well known as the author of the Daily Study Bible series, evaluated this book as meticulously Recorded, profoundly informative, and scholarly, a must-read. Can you believe that? Furthermore, Daniel Pauling, the editor of the Christian Herald, Mark, remarked that the author of this book demonstrates a more careful approach to learning from the New Testament than many devout Christians who read it, showing a deep reverence for the Scriptures. 
it is definitely, absolutely absurd. Absurd. What does the Bible say about the resurrection of Jesus Christ? The Bible clearly testifies that Jesus rose again. Amen? First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14 through 15 says, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that He raised Christ from the dead, but He did not raise Him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. So Apostle Paul clearly emphasizes that without resurrection of Jesus Christ, our faith would be nothing, useless. It is so clear that the crux of the matter of Christianity is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection is not a philosophical concept, but a historical fact. We believe in it because it's true. It's important to note that we don't embrace Christianity simply because we like, love some of the doctrines or some of the theologies in the Bible, or Christianity is simply attractive or appealing. No, that is not the reason why we believe in the Lord. Instead, it's because this truth is absolutely anchored in the Bible, and God revealed Himself through this book, through the gospel. That's why we believe in it. No matter how good the teachings of the other religions may sound or seem, we must not believe in their God because it's false, period. It's not that we are trying to be disrespectful to other religions, but it's simply it's a fake God, man-made gods and man-made religions. That's why we don't believe in it. Why do we believe in Jesus? Why do you? Should I say we? Why do we? Why do we believe in Jesus? Huh? Is it because he loves us? Is it right? No, you're not supposed to say amen here. <laughs> what if other gods also say, hey, I love you? Are you going to believe in that God as well? See? We don't believe Jesus just because He loves us. Although we just, you know, had a first song, Jesus loves me. <laughs> no, we don't believe in Jesus just because He loves us. What if Buddha loves you? What if Allah loves you? Are you going to love them back? No. That is not the case. We believe in Jesus because He is the only true living God, the Son of God who incarnated as the Messiah and dying on the cross and resurrected on the third day so that we could have eternal life in Him. Because it is a historical fact that we believe. Not because God loves us. There are many gods out there claim that they also love people. We don't fall for that. In today's passage, we encountered the first attempt to cover up the resurrection of Jesus. This can be considered the oldest recorded conspiracy theory in history. Interestingly, before the news of Jesus' resurrection reached his disciples or this lady's women, it was first revealed to his adversaries, the guards, you know, who were at the tomb when the angel descended and moved the stone. So technically speaking, the first witness of the resurrection were not the uh, women or disciples, but the guards. How did they react? According to uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 4, Upon seeing the angel, they were so frightened that they shook and became like dead men. It was nearly a cardiac arrest situation. You know, we had this CPR class before, and 
probably they might you know, have needed CPR or something, right? The women, including Mary Magdalene, who witnessed this sight, must have also been quite fearful, therefore, in verses 5 through 6. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, but he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Would the guards on the verge of near cardiac arrest have heard these words? Yes, absolutely. Though they may have not shown any reaction at that moment because they were so frightened, kind of freaked out, it's reasonable to assume that they heard, they heard it clearly. When the women ran to the informed disciples about what, had, you know, what they had seen and heard, at the same time, some guards went to report uh, to the chief priest in Jerusalem. Uh, they went to, you know, these authorities uh, to just, you know, let them know what happened. Uh, therefore, you know, they must, they must have heard, you know, this message from the angels, right? It's very interesting to consider the state of mind of the guards uh, at that moment. Think about it. They must have been like kind of, um, you know, frightened, anxious, and perplexed, uh, also, you know, facing an encounter with an angel was fearsome enough, but, you know, the high priests weren't any less intimidating to those guards. Why? Because these guards, their duty was so important, and yet they failed. So facing these authorities, the guards were like, I mean, you know, they just probably lost their mind, Right? What kind of penalties are waiting for them? They had no idea. Oh, so they were fearful. In every possible, in every way, he, you know, they were very frightened. However, when they reported this unbelievable sin they had witnessed, the high priest surprisingly responded by not rebuking, not giving them any punishment, but rewarding them with the money. That's what happened, right? Why? To cover up the truth. To bribe them, the money was given instead of a penalty, instead of a punishment. That's interesting. And perhaps these guards... In due time, it's just, you know, my imagination, but they might have testified Jesus' resurrection. Why? Money can only do so much, but the truth will be revealed at the end of the day. It will be revealed one way or another. Their conspiracy is revealed in verse 13. Tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. Look at how you know, flimsy this conspiracy was. If all guards were asleep without any disturbance, how could they be sure that it was the disciples who stole the body of Jesus? If everybody slept, if there was no eyewitness, how is it even possible that, you know, Disciples came in and broke in and stole the body. Now, if there happened to be a someone who saw disciples stealing the body of Jesus, even if the other guards were asleep, why wouldn't he wake them up to stop these disciples? Why didn't he do that? When you think about disciples of Jesus from Galilee, they're fishermen. They're not fighters. They're not soldiers. As opposed to these guards, heavily armed, well-trained. You know, these followers of Jesus' disciples were no match to these soldiers. So why didn't they stop them in the first place? Let's say for argument's sake that the disciples were thieves who stole the body of Jesus if so, why didn't they immediately mobilize the soldiers to arrest them, even if they missed them 
uh, you know, at that right moment, I mean, they could have like uh, mobilized the force, soldiers and troops to track down these disciples and secure the body of Christ, right? It's only a reasonable, reasonable uh, response. But there was not even an attempt to do so. See, this conspiracy theory is such a like, uh, flimsy, uh, pretty weak conspiracy. Just like they had tried to kill Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, the adversaries of Jesus had the same mindset. His enemies already made up their minds not to believe the fact that Jesus rose again. But, you know, this, del- this, del- uh, this belief wasn't due to insufficient evidence. That is not the case. They just decided not to believe in Jesus in no matter circumstance. That's what it is. And today, as we evangelize people in the streets, whether it is street settings or relational evangelism settings, we see some people, their hearts are so hardened that it's not so much about evidence or proof, but they just made up their mind not to believe in Jesus no matter what. We see that oftentimes. That's why we truly believe, and as the Bible confirms, salvation is through faith by God's grace. Amen? Amen. It's a free gift. It's a free gift. We have to have this grace falling from heaven. Otherwise, without the Holy Spirit, no one can confess that Jesus is the Lord. That is the bottom line. And it's kind of interesting to see this fact that um, those who turned a blind eye to Jesus' resurrection received the financial rewards, while those who acknowledged and proclaimed the resurrection later endured persecution. What a sharp contrast to here. What a sharp contrast do we see. But that's the, the fallen world we live in today. As we witness Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ and His death and resurrection, we might come across persecutions. Maybe not so much in the United States or South Korea, but still in many countries out there all over the world, there are persecuted Christians. And there are people who are so blind to the fact that Jesus died for us and resurrected for our eternal life, get some rewards in this world. Still happening today. Still happening. Later on, you know, looking at Peter and John's first arrest because of their witnessing, of course, we see their boldness despite the situation, despite this persecution. Acts chapter 2, verse 22, 23, it says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and for knowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, losing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. The message of the gospel was deeply challenging to religious leaders and prompting them to imprison and warn the apostle not to speak or teach in Jesus' name. Yet, despite these warnings, Peter and John boldly proclaimed the gospel, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, um, once they were released. When you look at the third arrest of the apostles, um, this third arrest kind of show their unwavering determination. They don't know how to stop. They don't know how to give up. Acts chapter 5, verse 29 through 32. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior 
to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witness to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. Their uncompromising stance reveals their firm belief in sharing the gospel truth, no matter the circumstances. The apostles were likely aware of the uh, uh, animosity of these priests and leaders, right? They were not kind of slow. They knew that these people were so hardened in their hearts that it's unlikely that they become Christians no matter how many times they preach the gospel. And yet, they didn't stop. I think that's the takeaways from today's passage. Because so often times, we come up with a prejudgment by saying, oh, that person is not going to believe in Jesus. I can tell. I tried. One time, two times, I tried to share the gospel before, but this person is not listening. Maybe God's plan for this person's salvation is not there. So we easily give up. Very convenient, right? Yeah. But let's take a look at disciples from today's passage. It's not that they were stupid. But they just kept on proclaiming the gospel to these authorities and priests and leaders. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was compelling them to do so. That's why at the end of that sentence here, so is the Holy Spirit. So is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. Now, for, the, for those who uh, went out to uh, street evangelism before in your lifetime, you know what I'm talking about. You know, like, we just have to deal with this fearable rejections. You know, you just approach it to these strangers and then you, you try to initiate these gospel conversations and sometimes you get this cold look from these people. As if, you know, these people despise us, look down on us. We just have to put up with that, you know, attitude in order to proclaim the truth. Not because we prejudge others and say, hey, this person, you know, seems like maybe uh, this person has a good heart to receive the gospel. Let me just approach and see how it goes. We don't prejudge people. And I know that, you know, um, a lot of Koreans living in the United States, especially, you know, um, I'm sorry to say this to Koreans, but Koreans around here, um, their attitude is like, I've been there, done that. I, I heard enough of this, you know, church stuff. So their response is like, their reaction is like, get away from me. So throughout the Passion Week, as I was in H Mart every day, I got that from many Koreans. As opposed to non-Koreans, uh, I don't want to be, uh, you know, biased about all this, you know, Korean, non-Korean stuff, but... Um, just, you know, from my limited experience, not only, you know, in this H Mart, but I've done it many years in the past in the state of New York, and I just realized that God opens up the door for many, many nations and ethnic groups. Amen? Amen. Some Americans and some Koreans are so spoiled, and they don't want to hear the gospel. Why? Because their life on earth is like heaven. Yeah. They think, you know, they have everything, so they don't need God. But there are people out there, marginalized people out there, who are in need in many ways. And their soul and spirit is poor. And that's why they are blessed. They will hear the gospel. They realize that they need Jesus more than ever in their lives. 
for people who are relatively, you know, better off, financially speaking, they don't think they need Jesus. They think this life on earth is almost to heaven. Money can do everything kind of a mentality. The Romans chapter 10, verse 13 through 15. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. I do believe that <clears throat> even if 9 out of 10 rejects the gospel out there in the streets, there has to be a soul prepared by the Lord of their salvation. And all we have to do is knock on the doors of their hearts to see if their salvation is planned by our God. It is our job to find that out. It's not that, you know, our words are so powerful and our wisdom is so high up there that we could persuade someone through our evangelism. Dream on. That's not going to happen. All we have to do is to follow the voice of the Spirit who compels us to testify that Jesus died on the cross and He rose again for our eternal life. If we keep silent for whatever reasons, we are becoming more like guards from today's passage. Maybe we're not getting money directly for being silent about the gospel. But if sharing the gospel causes inconvenience in any way, then we're just like guards. We're getting something out of this world for being silent about the gospel. It's a sin. So as I just wrap up today's message, again, my intention is not to offend you. It's not to make you feel guilty in terms of evangelism. That's the last thing I want to do because the guilt is not a driving force. It shouldn't be a driving force for us to serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. No, guilt is not, shouldn't be the driving force. No, it's got to be the Holy Spirit burning inside of us and compelling us to speak up that Jesus died for our sins and on the third day God raised Him so that we could also have this eternal life in Jesus Christ. So may the Lord continue to bless us and also challenge us that we may be the witness of Jesus Christ in our lives. Amen? Amen. Would you all stand up? We're going to just take the time to pray. Uh, I want us to respond uh, to the message today. Uh, you know, lately we had a mission conference with IMB. Uh, it was very fruitful. A lot of people responded to the altar call. Um, and uh, I remember that I was asking people to respond it, uh, whether it is mission abroad or mission in this community. I specifically asked the people, like, if you want to be used by the Lord in reaching out to this either community, this Tacoma, or overseas, I invited them to this altar, this front stage. And a lot of people came to the front. And I don't remember who they are, but almost 40 people, 50 people, they responded. I want to just remind you today that God is still looking for His faithful servants who will say, yes, Lord, I'm in. I'm in your business. 
furthering your kingdom through our sharing the gospel. In terms of the results, we leave it up to God. But our responsibility is to share the good news. So as we pray right now, if the Lord has spoken to you, to your hearts this morning, would you respond it to the Lord once again? I'm not going to ask you to come up, but I want you to seriously respond to the Lord and say, Lord, for the rest of my life, I want to be the vessel of this gospel, the channel of the blessings. Whether that person is amongst my friends, relatives, family members, or the people in the streets. I want to be bold when it comes to sharing the gospel. Would you use me? Would you anoint my lips that I can articulate the gospel? Would you join us this prayer all together? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. <clears throat> we pray that as we respond to you this morning. God, we pray that you'd use us, use every single one of the members in this room, Lord God, that you could just send us to your people, the lost out there, and yet you know that they will come back to you through our witnessing, so God, would you continue to just utilize our ministries here and the congregations we have in TFBC in a way that we could reach out to these neighbors, penetrate this community with the gospel, Lord God, and bring them back to you, Jesus. They belong to you, Lord. So as we share the gospel, whether to our friends or strangers, whether it's confrontational evangelism or relational evangelism, Lord God. However it comes, Lord, we want to make the most of our opportunities and be able to share the gospel. So would you anoint us and strengthen us, empower us to make the disciples of all nations. Doesn't have to be Korean, doesn't have to be Americans. Look at all nations. Father, we are willing to reach out. Use us, Lord. Be with us. And be the center of our meetings and worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the fact that you've called us first, which we don't deserve. But for some reasons, you called us first so that we could also call others in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for letting us be a part of your business, your ministry, and that we could just reach out these neighbors and communities with the saving message of Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. And would you continue to remind us that it is our responsibility. Just as worship is our responsibility as believers, Lord God, it is our duty, privilege, and responsibility to share the good news of Jesus Christ to our neighbors and even to people in overseas, people in the streets. Wherever we go, Lord God, we know that the Holy Spirit dwells in us and walking inside of us. So God, we pray this morning that let the Holy Spirit take over and reign over us that we may be the channel of this blessing, this blessings of Jesus Christ. May the Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the love of God Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us, be with you all now and forever. Amen.